The history of our world is filled with interesting and life-changing events, some more important than others. But not a single one of these events can rival the truly greatest one, the Great Awakening, which was a revolution that changed course of history forever. For it not only ended untold millennia of elven dominion over all races, it also paved the way for the world we know today, one of progress and civilization, so different from magical past where elven magic reigned supreme. And like many other critical moments in history, this one too began with a bang. Namely, an explosion that levelled one of the goblin cities in which a group of their brightest engineers and craftsmen worked on some mysterious, secretive project. As was said before, said goblins, descendants of those sent by elves away from the Empire to prepare other lands for colonization, learned that various minerals extracted from the ground and mixed together could create a weapon so devastating that it dwarfed even skills of elven sorcerer kings. Unfortunately though, while that weapon was so deadly, it also proved to be rather unreliable, and blew up in its creators' faces, turning both them and everyone and everything for several kilometers around them into ash, and leaving only a cavernous crater in its wake. And perhaps that is where the dream of awakening would end, if not for the fact that some of the goblins anticipated such a malfunction and prepared detailed schematics of the weapon beforehand, which they then hidden away from the city. What's more, these new schematics also contained theories on how to improve weapons' performance and reliability, and, finally, on how to use it to finally remove the threat of all powerful sorcerer kings from the world, and achieve freedom for all servants they have created, not just a handful of those sent into distant lands. Thus, when the schematics were uncovered in the wake of first fatal explosion, those who followed in footsteps of these goblin visionaries already knew what mistakes to avoid, and, over the course of several decades, perfected their device in utmost secrecy, until finally, after many years of hard work, it was ready to be used. And it would use elven arrogance and pride against them to deliver the killing blow right under their perfectly sculpted noses. Each and every year, a fleet filled with riches of the southern continent was sent back to the Empire as a tribute of sort, not only to enrich that mighty realm even more, but also to ensure that colonists would never accumulate too much wealth, for that could give them ideas way above their stations. That one, fateful final fleet, however, was going to be so much more, for amongst the gold and silver bars, buried beneath exotic spices and barrels of wine, people of the southern continent also hid their device, and entrusted their lives to the delegation that would deliver it. A single mistake would see their plan exposed, and, even though sorcerer kings of that age were nowhere near as powerful as first ancient ones, would no doubt bring bloody retribution upon the southerners, one that would end their dreams of freedom for ages to come. The elves, however, were not suspecting anything. Centuries upon centuries of loyal servitude made original inhabitants of the Empire weak and decadent, unable to live without beings of various other races performing their duties for them at every step. Generation after generation grew up in sweet haze of laziness and superiority, knowing from earliest years that countless other people stood at attention to cater to their every whim, if only out of fear of the aforementioned sorcerer kings. After all, even slightest hint of seditious thoughts was punished with a gruesome death to serve as a warning to all other slaves, and so even though most of the lesser races resented their masters, no one dared to rise up and oppose them. Until the fateful day of Great Awakening, the fleet reached Imperial shores and, from there, continued its journey to the capital city, built in the very centre of the country. With smiles and servile groveling hiding their true intentions, the delegation managed to reach the very heart of empire that created them as mere tools and there, when all sorcerer kings gathered to receive their tribute, they enacted their plan, sacrificing themselves for all people of lesser races so that they could finally become masters of their own future. Very little is actually known about the event itself, other than a very simple description. In one moment, the proud elven capital stood strong as a bastion of their dominion over all world. But in another, a massive explosion turned it and several neighbouring cities into ash, scattered on the wind. 
when the device was detonated. It happened so quickly that not even the most powerful of Sorcerer Kings could defend themselves against its power, and so they were vaporized together with almost 5 million of other elves and over 10 million of servants. The explosion was so powerful that it was heard even on the southern continent, and the shockwave shattered windows hundreds of kilometers away, and the continent itself was almost split in half. Earthquakes buried cities all around the Empire, and some parts of burning scorched debris flew so far that some bits of Imperial land ended up in the colonies. But that was a mere start of this event, for it also managed to achieve the original goal of its creators. All Sorcerer Kings were dead, reduced to nothingness by that world-shattering explosion. And with them gone, the Elves suddenly found themselves without any means of protection, surrounded by a great many servants who, slowly but surely, realized that their masters no longer had any power over them. When the uprising finally started, roughly a month after the explosion, it engulfed the whole empire as fast as flames engulf dry steppes. Elves, softened by generations of peaceful life, were unprepared for such violence, and so stood no chance against furious, determined servants who rose up in millions to exact revenge against their former masters, even though, on many occasions, there was no reason to do so. On many occasions, the servants simply left, and their masters starved to death, unable to tend to their own fields without help of those who they considered to be beneath them. But of course, extermination of an entire country is not something that happens overnight, and for almost six next decades, the Empire was engulfed in chaos. Eventually, some elves managed to organize themselves and offered resistance, but against their hardened servants, especially orcs who were born to be wardens and soldiers, they stood little chance, and all pockets of resistance were extinguished almost as soon as they appeared. Fifty-eight years after that fateful explosion rocked the world, last remnants of old elven empire were put to sword, marking an end of this once powerful race that numbered over 200 million. Not a single Imperial left was alive, with only one spared being castoffs and runaways who lived in the colonies, and would one day unite their petty kingdoms and found the Emerald Council. The old empire was gone, but in a way, its history was not yet over, for like so many things in this world, it too rose up from the dead several centuries later. And what was once a mere ruin, stands proudly today as the greatest and most powerful state in the world once more. After hard-won victory in the Ashen Forest and linking up with Tigrans, Prince Arius and his colonial army found themselves in an interesting situation. In theory, the main objective of their expedition has been achieved, the undead scourge that plague island of the Cat People has been dealt with, and Medzaka's new allies could now finally move out of their hidden settlement and try to restore order to their island. But at the same time, with the numbers greatly reduced in recent years, not only due to dregs but also to some other factors that colonials would soon learn about, the Tigrans had little hope to actually retake their smaller settlements that dotted the island, and so Medzagans immediately set off to help them, even though the Council was not pleased about their yet another prolonged departure. Still though, the Prince presented a solid argument. If the Tigrans were able to take control of their island, trade between them and the colony would no doubt increase even more, and the mention of gold was more than enough to convince majority of the councillors to extend Arius's leave and send him additional supplies and reinforcements, and especially that second part was desperately needed, as the army was badly damaged after their fight against undead monsters. The size of the camp was reduced almost by half, with some companies being completely disbanded due to heavy losses, and although some of the wounded sent back home could be saved and brought back into fighting shape, the army was still in dire need of additional manpower, even after Tigran elders provided them with a squad of tiger-riding cavalry. 
And so, Lord Governor and his men marched out into fiery, ashen wilderness once more to deal with local wildlife and bandits, or to be more precise, Crimson Company mercenaries, who used chaos of undead invasion to take control over almost entirety of the island. Once again, Metzakans realized just how different this place was from the continent. Their main island might have been secured and civilized by now, but the rest of Archipelago remained as wild as ever. So wild, in fact, that Arcadian's drones sent out to map out nearby islands were slowly picked off one by one by wild animals, to the point that entire scouting operation had to be put on hold. Regardless though, despite majority of the drones being either damaged or destroyed, they still managed to transmit some very interesting data, namely location of yet another settlement, this one located directly in control zone of Crimson Star Company. Continental powers, as it seemed, were not as disinterested in these islands as they pretended to be. That discovery, however, paired with yet another group of dwarven mercenaries that harassed outlying Tigran villages, led to yet another one. For after the mercs were taken out, one of the soldiers found written orders on the body of a dwarven commander. Orders that told him to, in case of any serious trouble, fall back to yet another island close to the west, where the company constructed a temporary base, although, needless to say, this particular group of soldiers of fortune failed to retreat there when Arius and his men came knocking. Still, the letter also mentioned yet another interesting thing. Apparently, if the commander of these mechs had too many wounded, he could send them to a Tigran settlement. Except not the one they were raiding, but another one also located on that nearby island. As it turned out, there were a lot more Tigrans there, and Prince Arius, armed with that knowledge, rode back to the town of his allies and confronted them about this revelation. The response of their elders was a lot of nervous shuffling, muttering, and then, finally, an explanation. This second Tigran town was not some kind of hostile tribe. They were, in fact, outcasts of the very first settlement, those who, in recent decades, became dissatisfied with leadership of the elders and moved to another side of this strait to build their own community. And though at first no one really believed they could achieve anything, these young bloods, as they called themselves, managed to create themselves quite a prosperous town, although the source of that prosperity also turned out to be the main source of conflict between two tribes. For the young bloods' new wealth was not entirely their own doing. A few years ago, they aligned themselves with the Crimson Company, which provided them with all they needed to get their settlement into working order. And in return, all the Tigrans had to do was to simply proceed with their plan, go back to the main island and take out the Elders, creating a small, independent state and also, conveniently, spread influence of the Crimson Company, who seemed very interested in the Cat People and their goods. For a good while, it seemed that nothing would stop them from enacting that plan, but now, with Medzakan army on the scene, situation suddenly changed. Prince Arius could now step in and, on behalf of his allies, bring this wayward town to heel, and, even better, he could do so without causing an international scandal, for this was one of the few situations where Crimson Company's secrecy actually worked against them. Sure, the young bloods were aligned to them and everyone knew it, but when it came to official documentation, their alliance was signed not with Crimson Star itself, but with some independent mercenary outfit with no traceable ties to the company itself. After all, it would be a bit of a stain on Crimson reputation if the company was caught in the middle of funding a proxy war. And so, Prince Arius could move into that island and restore order to it, as he said to both Tigran elders and to the councillors back home. In truth, however, the last Erigen already had a plan for this place. After all, having a forward base deeper in the archipelago could make his further escapades into the islands much easier. And so, he and his men got to walk, aware that the council once again would be busy with something else, namely, opening ceremony of a grand palace that was built over the past few months at the very top of the cliff, overlooking the entire city. Until now, Medzakan government had to fit into a small, cramped, old-fashioned building near the Forge District, but this new seat of power was something else entirely. 
Not only beautiful and imposing, but also, thanks to Arcadian's inventions, it was also one of the most modern buildings in the entire city, with running water and gas lights that illuminated opulently decorated corridors. Not to mention that, in case of trouble, the building could be locked down and turn into an almost impenetrable fortress. It was, without a doubt, a crown jewel of the city of Medzaka, and so many of the councillors moved their offices there to benefit from prestige of the building itself. Which, as it happened, was also exactly what Arcadian wanted them to do all along. Speaking of Arcadian, he was just as busy as ever with his inventions and factories, constantly building or designing something that people of Medzaka could use to improve their daily lives, or, in cases of weapons, to ruin lives of someone else. At this point, his ever-increasing group of artificers walked day and night to reverse-engineer continental cannons and add some of their own flair to them, for, after all, according to military strategists everywhere, and artificers themselves of course, no modern battlefield was complete without at least a battery or two of hulking, thundering bombards that could change the course of battle in mere moments. But while artificers were busy with that project, the workers had their hands full as well with another one, namely, installation of fuel cells in factories and workshops all over the city. As was said before, the magic-infused rocks extracted all over the island could be used to store a large amount of energy, and now, with a bit of artificer wisdom, that energy could be stored almost indefinitely in specially prepared metal canisters and released when necessary. What's more, it was even possible to plug these canisters to various machines and have them release their energy in set intervals and set quantities, which allowed for a surprisingly large degree of automatization. Many mundane tasks, like, for example, hammering metal plates in forges, could now be done without either living walkers or even undead, which greatly improved the industrial potential of the city. Although, it has to be said, it also reduced its aesthetic value even more, as black smoke was ejected from chimneys all across the city day and night without even a momentary pause. Another issue was of course the fact that many walkers, even undead ones, would soon find themselves without jobs, and while mindless shamblers could easily be dragged off to some another workshop and placed next to some endless assembly line of chairs or swords, things looked decidedly worse for living and breathing people, who had to either quickly increase their qualifications or try to look for fortune outside of the city walls. But that was now a lot less deadly proposition than mere few years ago, all thanks to Prince Arius and his relentless drive to turn this colony into a proper, respectable nation. And what better way to make a nation greater than to physically increase its size and population by conquering some small city-state, unrecognized by international community? With that thought in mind, Arius and his army moved further to the east, and after chasing off Crimson Company mercenaries who dropped their weapons and fled at the mere sight of Medzakan army, prepared to mend the divide between Tigrans, by force if necessary. But the young bloods, while fierce and independent, were no fools, and after their dwarven allies abandoned them, they quickly realized that Medzakan army had them desperately outnumbered. A quick revolutionary council was held, where leaders of this rebellion tried to find a way out of this situation, but after a mere few moments, all young bloods realized that all they can do is surrender or die fighting, and so, with heavy heart, option number one was chosen, and a delegation was sent to meet approaching Medzakan army and discuss terms of young blood surrender. Only problem was, said delegation never reached Arius, for a small group of the most militant rebels was more willing to die fighting than to surrender their independence. As soon as delegates left the town, they were intercepted and killed as traitors by those warriors, who set up a barricade on the road and prepared to ambush Medzakan forces when they came closer. And while this plan might have worked against a force of a similar size, against entire might of colonial army, it was doomed to fail from the very start. The ambush was spotted by surveillance drones, and then forced to come towards Arius' army by relentless bombardment from trebuchets and cannons. 
As one might expect though, as soon as Tigran warriors were in the open, they were welcomed by a hail of musket rounds and arrows, and by the time Knights of the Trident clashed with approaching rebels, most of the cat people were already broken. Within less than half an hour, young blood warriors were either dead, wounded or captured, while Medzakans suffered almost no casualties. The army then continued on and surrounded Tigran town and for a moment, it seemed that Lord Governor would order his men to attack it, but instead of doing that, he simply rode on ahead with some of his retainers and offered terms that no Tigran on either side expected. Arius argued that if Youngbloods broke away from the Elders to look for a better way of life, then by trying to force them back into their service would no doubt only cause yet another rebellion further down the line. On the other hand, treachery was something that the Prince truly was not on board with, a sentiment no doubt caused by the revolution back home, so leaving Youngbloods to govern themselves was out of the questions as well. So instead, Lord Erigen offered an alternative. This settlement, entire island and all Tigrans on it, would become part of Medzaka itself and answer directly to the prince. It wasn't exactly a result that either Tigran side wanted, but it was one with the highest chances of preventing yet another civil war and more bloodshed in nearby future. So, after a few hours of deliberation, the Revolutionary Youngblood Council agreed to it, and then disbanded to hand over their future into Aris' hands. Mere moments later, a message was sent back to the city of Medzaka to send a number of government officials to that newly conquered town, going by the name of Sidig, in order to establish official seat of Medzakan influence there and start assimilating young blood Tigrans into colonial society, a process that would no doubt take months or maybe even years, considering a myriad of cultural differences between those two nations. But as the message was sent, a curious and perceptive observer could have noticed that the prince has not sent it using the device reserved for conversations with the colonial council. Instead, the message was sent directly to Arcadian, and by the time he brought it up to the palace to be reviewed, for after all he was known to be a scatterbrain with no patience for politics, a select group of officials was already on their way to Sigurd to make it part of Medzakan colonial region, but not in the name of entire colonial government, but on behalf of Prince Erigen alone. While that was happening, however, something strange occurred on the eastern shore of the island of Medzaka. With the new ports opened in Surkaris, cold seas there were regularly patrolled by several elven cutters, small, maneuverable warships that were no match for any organized force, but could still deter random pirates or wayward sea creatures from bothering merchant ships. For the crew of one of such cutters, though, their routine patrol suddenly became a lot more exciting when they spotted a frostling longboat, moored on the shore mere few dozen kilometers south of Surkaris. The elf captain decided to investigate it, fully expecting it to be some long abandoned wreck, but as soon as the cutter got closer, frostling crew emerged from the forest on the shore, boarded the longboat and slipped into the sea. The crew of the cutter prepared for a hard fight and unfurled all their sails to catch the wind, but to their surprise, these frozen ones were seemingly not interested in combat. Instead, they moved towards open sea, using their oars to move against the wind, no doubt in hopes of leaving the cutter behind, as it was a lot harder for a sailboat to follow them with wind blowing in its face. The cutter, however, was fast and maneuverable enough that its crew, under watchful eye of its captain, managed to tack its way against the wind and kept on following the longboat to the west and into the open sea. The chase lasted for well over a week, with the cutter moving far away from safe waters and towards the cold, frozen island to the west, with a small silhouette of the longboat still ahead of them. But on the tenth day of that chase, something else appeared on the horizon, and when the elven captain saw it, a glimming shape of massive, icy spire, he immediately ordered his men to turn around and get back to Surkaris as quickly as possible. For although Frostlings were known for their spires, a one such as this only appeared once before, and dealing with it was way, way above pay grade of a simple merchant escort crew. Very well. Thank you for this report, Warchief, and thank you for your discretion on the matter. 
From what you have told me, it is clear that Crimson Merchants wish to goad us into attacking them, although I cannot tell what do they wish to achieve by forcing conflict between us. Regardless, I am glad you managed to avoid their trap. The last thing we need right now is another war to distract us from a goal, not to mention that in past decades we have lost too many of our brothers and sisters to engage in such pointless fights. Still, while I approve of your retreat from that front, we cannot allow Cridians to simply walk over us, which is why I am sending you back to the west to establish a defensive line against their mercenaries. If they wish to engage us in irregular warfare, then we will respond in kind. I'll see about sending you additional forces, Warchief. For now though, you are dismissed. Now then, Admiral, I thank you for your patience, but I can tell from the look on your face that you have news for me, so let's skip formalities and get on to business. Of course, wise one. I bring news from our explorers and outlying tribes. Per your orders, I have sent messages to all forces sent beyond Isle and ordered them to return home. By now we received a response from most of them, and the vast majority complied with your orders. They shall be returning soon. Very good, but I take that not all of our chieftains were willing to obey, correct? I am afraid so. As you well know, some of our people are completely consumed by their violent nature. To them, being ordered to retreat is beyond dishonorable. However, as you said before, we can't allow any more disunity amongst the tribes, and so I have also dispatched hunters to bring the offending tribes back by force if necessary. Unfortunately, while some raiding tribes return to the fold, in most cases the only thing our hunters managed to achieve was even more bloodshed. And what's worse, we haven't twin our own people. I see. This loss of life is tragic and will no doubt set us back, but I would lie if I said that I did not see that coming. My master, our master, made us that way for better or worse. Now there's nothing else for us to do but to deal with our new nature as best as we can. But I can sense that there is something else troubling you, Admiral. Please, tell me what weighs on you. Very well. It's not much, but I've received some messages from our hunters sent to that large island to the east. The tribe that was sent to settle it is gone and their spire has been destroyed. At first we had no idea who did this, but then some of our longboats and carried ships moved between various settlements of that island. They were all marked with the white trident, my lord. So men of Southern finally decided to take care of their colonies. These are not good news, Admiral. Of all continental powers, Kingdom of Southern was our fiercest enemy, so I would assume they're already looking for us. Do you know how long has it been since the tribe was wiped out? Hard to say, but according to our hunters it must have been almost a year ago, maybe even more. And yet, the Tridents are not here yet. Curious. Maybe they're not aware of our existence just yet, then. Maybe they think that those people they defeated were just some broken remnants of original rebellion. If that's the case, then we should do our best to hide our presence so they keep thinking that. I don't think we can deal with both them and Cridians at the same time. A wise suggestion, my lord. We should deal with the merchants first, but then turn our attention east to avenge our master. Or we could try to do what he failed to and focus on our mission. Remember, Admiral, that before he fought a war against the whole continent, our master wanted to help all of us. But in the end, he was forced to fight because the ritual did not work as he intended. Something somehow managed to disrupt it, and instead of turning entire world and every living being on it, the spell only affected small portions of it. And while the Archmage was the best sorcerer in ages, his magical skills were sadly not representative of his tact or his strategic capabilities. In the moment he realized what his spell has done, he should have stepped up and explained everything to the world. Instead, he did nothing, and when goblins sent out an expeditionary force to find out what happened, he ordered us to destroy it. Perhaps, the more I think about it, the more I wonder if he wasn't afflicted with the same aggression that plagues the rest of our people. It would explain his erratic actions, and the fact that when other continental powers marched out to avenge their decimated populations, he threw his original plan to the wind to fight them. Or maybe he knew that with our sworn enemies on the continent, he would not be able to achieve his goal. But it doesn't matter now he's dead, and we now have a chance to exact vengeance upon those who killed him. Do you truly wish for us to just ignore that? 
to let the people who slaughtered our creator go unpunished. Yes, don't forget that I was our master's apprentice. Before his ritual went wrong, he never wanted to start a war. He simply wanted to help, to prepare us for what's coming. He should have talked to other continental leaders and at least try to explain his plan. Instead, he chose violence, and we all know how that went. There was already too much bloodshed in our history. We have to break that cycle, or we'll never achieve anything. But let me guess, that Eastern tribe also ignored my warnings and fought with colonists of Southern, am I right? No. No need to respond, Admiral. I can see the answer on your face clear as day. And I do not care who started these hostilities. That was why I was against dividing our host into smaller tribes, but I suppose what's done is done. We'll have to deal with the situation as best as we can, and hope that we can find the source of disturbance that brought all this trouble upon us. But if blood was spilled between our people and colonists of Southern, then I doubt that we'll ever be able to convince them to even talk to us, let alone help with our mission. We should prepare for the worst, Admiral. Go now and rouse the Deep Ones. Time for them to repay their debts. When the patrol cutter finally returned to Circares two weeks later, it didn't take long for the news its crew brought back to spread across the colony like wildfire. The topic that was on everyone's lips were frostlings. The frostlings were here, and they were not like those small, disjointed tribes or roving warbands that Medzakans had to deal with in previous years. These new frostlings were decidedly more numerous and organized, and, at least from what little the crew of Elven Patrol could see from their ship, driven towards some mysterious goal, although what it could be was anyone's guess. So, it's a little wonder that, in the very moment these news reached colonial settlements, they became a priority for everyone, and caused significant concern among the population. After all, there was only one time before when these icy beings were organized like that, and it was during Archmage's Rebellion, where they were led by their master and creator in a war that decimated the old continent, and caused untold amounts of death and destruction. As soon as the Council learned about it, the leaders of Medzaka gathered in their palace to discuss what to do, and, obviously, the very first step was to increase defense of the coastal settlements, especially Surkaris itself. But their discussion was not free of confusion and bewilderment, for the report of Elven Captain also mentioned yet another thing that separated these Frostling from ones Colonials and Continentals faced before. These new ones were apparently peaceful, or at the very least not hostile, which was a surprise in itself. In all of their previous encounters, Frostlings always behaved aggressively from the very start, but this time they were clearly uninterested in fighting the Colonial Patrol, even though they seemingly had at least several opportunities to do so. According to the crew, at least three other longboats were encountered during their chase, and neither of them behaved in a hostile way. On the contrary, one of them even approached the cutter, and its crew waved to the elves, an act that was never reported before. And on the way back, the patrol also encountered several fishing and whaling boats, all of which simply kept their distance and did nothing to raise suspicions, which, in a way, was suspicious by itself. Such erratic behavior was new for the Frostlings, and so the Council decided to send out Commodore Yarohin, recently promoted to act as a commander of Colonial Navy, to take his ships west and confirm reports of that single elven patrol. But their objective was not just finding out what Frostlings were up to, the Arohin was also ordered to investigate two other things, both of which could prove to be immensely important for the future of entire colony. His fleet, when it finally departed on this mission, was significantly stronger than the a few months before, mostly thanks to contribution of elven shipwrights from Surkaris, who used their experience, backed by machinery provided by the capital city, to start building warships of their own. And over the last few months, they have reinforced Colonial Navy with two cruisers, similar in size to Mezzakan frigates, but sleeker and faster, and crewed with highly trained marines who specialized in naval archery, a skill that was a lot more difficult to master than regular ground-based one. 
and although these cruisers were not equipped with ballistae, or any other artillery like human warships were, they more than made up for it with another surprise, namely a heavy, steel-plated ram on the front, additionally improved thanks to little gift from Arcadian's artificers. For aside from the ram, the cruisers were also equipped with a traceable arm where a crafty captain could place something to hang in front of their ship, like, for example, a large ceramic pot filled to the brim with flammable oil, which would break apart during ramming and cover whatever enemy it struck in a slick substance that could then be ignited by onboard archers. So, not only were these cruisers capable of delivering much more powerful ramming maneuvers due to their increased speed, they could also set their foes ablaze during said maneuvers, something that was devastatingly useful against other warships and, of course, frostlings, who were naturally terrified of flames. Aside from that, Yarohin also brought with him a merchant ship, slow and cumbersome, but large and capable of carrying a ton of goods and supplies in order to support his fleet's operations. Back on the continent, navies mostly moved along the coast and resupplied by going ashore, but here, in this untamed archipelago, safe havens were almost impossible to find, and so Colonial Commodore decided to simply bring a safe haven along with him. The naval engineers based on the transport ship could not only patch up his warships, they could also quickly set up temporary ports for the fleet to use, without being forced to fall back all the way to the main island after every encounter. Of course, it meant that Medzakan sailors would spend months or maybe even years away from home, but for many of them that wasn't really an issue. After all, the open sea offered something that increasingly cramped Medzakan cities could not, freedom, and a lot cleaner air. The first and foremost objective of this fleet was to, obviously, confirm presence of a large number of organized frostlings, and mere few weeks after departing to the west, Yarohin's spotters reported a massive icy spire on the horizon, as well as significant amount of longboats darting across the sea in all directions, although, fortunately for colonial warships, they were mostly fishing boats and posed no threat to them. Hence, even when they spotted several warships, they always simply turned around and rode away at full speed, confirming yet another portion of Elven report. These frozen warriors, despite their tumultuous history with Continentals, were clearly not interested in fighting, which allowed Medzakan fleet to move further to the west and, braving extremely cold weather, snowstorms and freezing winds, pinpoint the location of the Frostling Spire, which was also surrounded by a sprawling, bustling city, seemingly filled to the brim with these creatures. And even though they were not hostile, Yarohin ordered his force to turn around anyway, if only to avoid provoking the Frostlings into making a move. Instead, he moved on to investigate first rumor brought back by the Elves, one that claimed that there were more semi-sunken ruins around the place, something that proved a lot more common here than anyone could expect. So, the rumor was quickly confirmed, and Medzakan naval engineers went on to create a temporary base that explorers and scholars from the capital could use, but at the same time, it was obvious that some of these ruins were unlike those that colonials have encountered before. Whoever their creators were, they clearly prioritized extremely tall buildings made out of some unknown, extremely hard metal and durable glass that, despite endless tides crashing into it over and over again, showed almost no signs of wear and tear. The size of the towers was spectacular as well, with one reaching over 200 meters above the sea level, and from what Yarohin's ghoul divers reported, it extended for further 300 under the waves, which made it over a half a kilometer tall, something unthinkable to anyone who witnessed it. Its builders must have fully mastered everything there was to know about architecture, or perhaps they had some otherworldly help, as evidenced by that unknown metal said towers were built from. But while such a discovery certainly was fascinating, and would give scholars both from Medzaka and back from the continent a lot to think about, it was slightly overshadowed by another, a bit more pragmatic find. For as Medzakan ships moved deeper into Frostling waters, they realized that aside from icy warriors, the sea was also full of various merfolk, 
like sirens and tritons, who, to complete surprise of colonial crews, seemed to be walking together with the cold ones. And in fact, they were often the reason why the longboats were able to outrun even fastest elven cruisers, for as soon as Medzakans tried to approach them, a group of sea creatures, sometimes intelligent, sometimes just beasts, would always appear and haul Frostling boats away at extreme speed, making it impossible to catch any one of them in the open. For a while, Commodore Yarohin hoped that such situations would only be sporadic, but the further he and his men sailed, the more evident truth became. For some unknown reason, creatures of the sea allied themselves with Frostlings and created a half-ground-based, half-underwater city in yet another forgotten ruin a few days south of the Icy Spire, where both groups could be seen working together towards their mysterious goals. Although some parts of that mystery soon became a lot less, well, mysterious, thanks to a message sent by one of Crimson Company's representatives. In it, the merchant described how, over the past few months, Frostling raiding parties constantly harassed their territory and raided their ports, and, in the name of entire company, offered generous rewards for any kind of military support. It was all written in that convoluted, overblown, bureaucratic way that Cridians loved so much, but the true message was clear as day. We need help, attack Frostlings from another flank, and we will make it worth your while. No wonder, then, that such a message quickly put the Council on even higher alert, and very soon a decision was made. Colonial Army was to be recalled as quickly as possible and start preparations to invade Frostling territory. There was, of course, the problem of merfolk walking side by side with said Frostlings, but most councillors could not believe that a bunch of mermaids could pose any danger to a fleet of advanced warships. Some voices called for peaceful interaction with both Frostlings and the merfolk in hopes of understanding them, but were quickly overshadowed by a vocal majority that saw an opportunity to not only deal with an old bitter enemy and avenge millions of deaths from the rebellion, but also to make a nice profit during it. And so, the vote was passed, message prepared, and, thanks to one of Arcadian's wondrous communication machines, sent to the Prince on the very same day. And this time, his Highness was fully on board with Council's idea. After all, he already was informed about Frosting's presence some time ago, on the very same day when these news reached his friend Arcadian. Arius's response, however, was still not as obedient as the Council would have wanted it, and he asked for few additional weeks to get the new Tigran-controlled island in order, something that even most vocal opposers of the Prince could not argue with, since said island could serve as a staging ground for their invasion. And so, the colony of Medzaka prepared for war, one that would be waged against an enemy that terrified everyone mere few decades before, but as soon as Arius' response returned to the city, its citizens quickly realized that this conflict would be different from the ones they've seen so far. This war would be fought not just with swords, spears and bows, but also with tools and machines built en masse in artificial factories, weapons that, in hands of properly trained troops, could give even an ordinary soldier means to take down a dragon. Even the aforementioned swords, spears and bows were no longer elegantly crafted by blacksmiths and bowyers, but produced in the hundreds by cold, rotting arms that manned endless, magically fueled assembly lines day and night. But such old-fashioned weapons, while reliable and most certainly necessary, would very soon be outshined by yet another one of Arcadian's inventions, one that addressed the main problem colonial forces had in this wild archipelago. The issue was that, when faced with wild monsters that roamed the islands, regular soldiers, even equipped with heavy armor, were unable to survive their attacks, and losing experienced veterans was something that Medzaka simply could not afford. The artificers from the colony presented various solutions, but in the end, Arcadian simply went along with his plan, one that gave each individual soldier so much protection that a platoon of men would no longer be considered infantry, but a siege engine. And that solution was a golem, though it annoyed at least several mages in the city, who already used magically created constructs going by the same name. Still, 
Artificer golems had almost nothing in common with those magical ones, for, simply put, they were nothing more but massive, magically powered suits of armor that a soldier could climb into and then pilot it from inside, protected by resilient metal plating. But these things not only offered protection, but greatly increased strength as well. With claws on the end of one arm and massive hammer on the other, a group of such golems could cleave and crash their way through any obstacle, be it a monster, a company of soldiers, or even walls of a castle, while their operators were safely tucked inside their protective armor. Arcadion also wanted to make a remote-controlled model, but with the new deadlines for delivery of more war machines, he had to put that idea on hold. After all, there was still one issue to deal with. Namely, the presence of Merfolk who, without a doubt, would join their Frostling allies should Medzakans decide to go to war against them. The Council might have been confident in capabilities of Colonial Fleet, but Commodore Yarohin himself was a lot more skeptical, and so artificers and shipwrights got to work to try and improve their chances against Sea Dwellers. But as work on new models of ships began, Arcadian once again provided an alternative. If the ocean was infested by potential enemies, he said, then the best option would be to simply remove it out of the equation. And although draining out of the entire sea was still beyond his capabilities, flying above it was not. Alright, privates, just two more steps and we're done, so come on. There we go, that worked out a lot better than I expected, although that doesn't mean anything since I honestly believe that it would not work at all. So, just one more test and you're free to go. You see those bottles on the table? I want you to pick up the middle one. Ready? Right, now keep it steady, just a bit to the left and… yes, you got it! Now, try and toss it into that marked area over there. Perfect! Now, pardon my narcissistic comment, but damn am I proud of that one. Those bloody conservative book ones back home would die of jealousy if they saw my golem right now. Right, enough self-praise, back to work. Thank you for your help, Private. You're free to go. Um, yes, thank you, but I may need a bit of help to get out of here. Ah, of course. Apologies, I forgot about your predicament. Hold on tight, I'll get you out of there in a moment. And there you go, Private. Once again, I have to thank you and your friends for your help with this project. We're the ones who should be thanking you, Mr. Arcadian. If that bloody bone machine crushed my legs and army doctors had to cut them off, I was terrified of coming back home. Sure, the prince got my mate and me some generous farewell gifts and he secured spots in that new hospital, but we were sure that most of us would spend the rest of our lives being nothing more than a burden for our families. I was afraid that I'd be forced to beg on the streets, but now, with these machines of yours, I can walk again. Hell, I could probably even go back to the army and fight again, since that's really the only thing I'm decent at. Not entirely. You're also a very good assistant. I couldn't have perfected this golem without your help and that of your friends. Granted, your varied conditions made it a lot harder to get it to work properly, but I enjoyed the challenge. So, if you really want to get back into the fray, then I suppose one of those machines is the solution for you. But if not, then I already have my workshops building several dozens much smaller ones, so you could use them to walk the streets without destroying the city in the process. These war golems turn out to be a lot less cumbersome than I thought, but they're still not that well suited to civilian tasks, although now that I think about it, maybe some of the warehouse workers in the docks could make use of them to carry their goods. Gonna have to talk with the council about that, I doubt they'll be happy to see uh, sorry, Private, I was rambling again. Just one more thing, though. If you really want to thank someone, you should thank the Prince. When he sent you back, he also sent a message in which he asked me to rework my golems so that people crippled in the fights could still use them, and to make those smaller civilian ones, which, believe it or not, were also a lot harder to make. He also sent a lot of gold from his personal share of the spoils to the hospital to ensure that all of the wounded would be healed free of charge. He did? I thought that staff in the hospital was paid by the council or something like that. Are you sure? Nobody mentioned anything about it. Aye, because the prince wanted to remain anonymous. Obviously, though, the world would get out sooner or later, and then he would be seen not only as a generous commander who cares about his men, and is also reasonably humble. Although, now that I think about it, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned that last thing. Oh well, what's done is done. I never had patience for those diplomatic games, but still I would be obliged if you kept that knowledge to yourself. 
If the end result is me being able to walk again, then I already don't remember what we were talking about. Still, the Prince might have orchestrated that, but you're still the one who made that idea a reality with your machines, so you deserve no less of our gratitude. Truth be told, ever since we saw those machines and weapons you designed, we were wondering why you wouldn't just join the army and walk on the road. I'm sure the Prince would have provided you with all the material you needed. Oh, no, I couldn't do it, I'm afraid. I need to stay in one place to think, and, well, to be honest, I'm not that good with violence. Even listening to your story about the battle made me feel weak in the knees, so if I saw the battle with my own eyes, I would probably just faint on the spot. I'm a pacifist, after all. No place for people like me in the army. A pacifist? But you designed all those deadly machines. You're building cannons right now as we speak. Aye, that I do. I also build steam engines, pumps, printing presses, combine harvesters, mining drills, and little toys that play music when you ask them to. I do what needs to be done, and though I would never use my designs to harm anyone, I still understand the inevitable truth of our lives. Sure, I may be opposed to violence, but there are plenty of people around who are not, so I would rather ensure that those on my side are well equipped, so that they can keep those violent ones as far away from me as possible. All I can hope for is that, one day, everyone will be on my side, and then all bloodshed will finally end, and then we'll be able to use my machines to fully understand this world, and build a better future in it. I know it sounds silly, no need to look at me like that. Silly or not, it's still an admirable ambition. But still, you said that you're fine with making weapons for people who are, as you said, on your side. But what if those you think your eyes will turn out to be your enemies? Or what if two of your friends will start fighting against each other? Then I'll... well, I never thought about that. I think I should start preparing some sort of contingency plan just in case. And I think I should do it right now. Thank you once again, Private. You're free to go, but... Are you sure you don't want to become my permanent assistant?